Well, good evening, everybody. It's always an honor and a privilege to be up here. I always get so excited when I get the opportunity to share the word. Take your Bibles tonight and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I wanted to share with you guys a couple of accounts and things that happened in history that I thought <clears throat> were pretty interesting. This first one's entitled, The Women Who Beat Hitler. <laughs> yeah. It was a cold February day in 1943. A multitude of German women stood outside a Jewish community center holding hands and shouting, Give us our husbands back. Nazi police came to the scene and they warned the women to scatter. They threatened them with machine guns, but the women refused to budge. To speak up against Hitler was extremely dangerous. It meant risking the safety of yourself and your family members. This frightening force kept the majority of the German people in silent submission to the Nazis' atrocious policies throughout Hitler's reign. Yet, despite this threat, there were a few cases in which some people took courage and refused to stand by and watch Hitler's evil policies in action. Hitler wanted to completely destroy the Jewish population in his capital city of Berlin. He ordered the majority of the Jews to be sent to death camps, but in 1943, a few still remained. These Jews were treated differently because they were married to German-born women. When Hitler rounded up this final group, their German wives worried that their dear husbands and sons would be forced to meet the mysterious and miserable fate of many of the Jews who had disappeared before them. And so they began to protest. Around 600 people, mostly women, banded together outside the community center where their men had been incarcerated. They chanted, sang songs, held hands, and sometimes just stood in silence. Although the police threatened them, they stood their ground. By the end of the week, a few thousand more women had joined the original 600. Even Hitler and his seemingly all-powerful Gestapo force couldn't stand against the courage of these women. They decided to release the men at Rosentrasse in fear that a demonstration of such bravery would inspire others to start larger protests throughout Germany. Nearly 2,000 Jews were released to their families, preventing Hitler from having his desired Jew-free Berlin. You imagine that? Yeah. They didn't teach me that in history class. You know? I have another account here. We're going from Nazi Germany to the American Revolutionary War. We all know the stories of courage displayed by the heroes of the American Revolution. George Washington and the historic crossing of the frigid Delaware River with his ragtag band of rebels courageously ambushing the enemy. The now fabled courageous ride of warning with Paul Revere alerting colonists to the impending danger. Sometimes great stories of courage slip through the cracks of history. During the Revolutionary War, wives of soldiers often accompanied their husbands to war. They helped attend to the needs of the camp Margaret Corbin was one of these wives. On November 16, 1776, Fort Washington in modern-day Manhattan was attacked by the British. John Corbin manned his place firing a cannon with the other 600 American soldiers. Margaret Corbin watched as her husband John was killed by cannon fire. Margaret immediately took his place and single-handedly fired his cannon. She volleyed cannon fire, helping to hold back the 4,000 strong British troops until she was massively injured and could stand no more. After the battle, soldiers commented on Margaret's bravery and courage in the line of fire. She killed many British soldiers and was complimented on her accuracy. Some even stated she was fierce as a lion. The story of Margaret Corbin spread, causing many men and women to take up arms for the fight for independence. 
150 years after her death, her remains were given a full soldier's burial, the only revolutionary veteran to receive this honor. <laughs> Margaret Corbin, a portrait in courage. I wanted to find a couple of accounts in history um, just to show people looking fear in the face. Just so happened I picked two that were all about women. <laughs> Take that what you may. Um, you know, the women in Germany and Margaret Corbin certainly were faced with scary situations. Situations that could cause most others to probably back down, to hide, to run away, or just shut down with fear. How would you handle it if you were faced with that similar situation? You know, you went off to war and your husband is killed in front of you. And she hops up on the cannon. She did what she had to do. So what would you do? Would you stand your ground knowing the consequences facing your decision of going against Hitler or anything similar to that? Or would you close your mouth and run away for fear of those consequences? These historical accounts highlight instances in which people did not let the fear determine what they were going to do. They didn't let the fear paralyze them or hold them back. It was there, the fear. They chose to stand up to it and to overcome it. And we can do the same. In any situation or circumstance in which there may be fear that you have, you can stand up and you can conquer it because God has given you the tools to be victorious. It's just up to us to decide if we're going to stand and claim what God says or let the fear of the consequences or the unknown hold us down. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll start in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So Paul is writing to Timothy and he's encouraging him. He's encouraging him to not be afraid or ashamed to speak the word, to preach Christ. You know, we're going through the historical events in the time of history. Think about the political and the cultural climate that they're dealing with right now. How many times has Paul been thrown in prison and been beaten and been stoned and how they had to escape him by night over the wall? You know, what kind of persecution have we had to face because of te te speaking the word? Paul was, Paul was mocked and he was laughed at, but we, we haven't really had to deal with much persecution. Every time that we keep our mouths shut instead of speaking the word, fear wins. It's fear that stops you from speaking the word. Obviously, our prime verse tonight is going to be verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The word fear... I'm sure I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but it's the Greek word delia, D-E-I-L-I-A. And this is an interesting use of the word fear. It denotes the outward manifestation rather than the sensation of fear. It's moral cowardice, timidity, terror, and fright. We can sense fear, but this is fear 
manifesting itself, stopping you. God didn't give us that spirit of fear. We'll look at a few places where this word is used. Look at Romans chapter 8. And in Romans 8, verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are sons. God has made us sons. We have not received the spirit of bondage. We're not under the law. We don't need to have that fear. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And in verse 10, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. He said, let him know, let Timothy know to not have, Timotheus to not have fear. Don't let him have that fear. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, John 20, verse 19. This is the day of the resurrection. Then that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. That fear. They didn't have that sensation of fear. They were locked behind closed doors out of fear. That fear was manifesting itself. Look at Psalm 34. Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Can God deliver us from our fears? Yes. Yes. I heard manifestations tonight. God told us exactly that. God can and will deliver us from our fears. I wanted to read an excerpt written by Dr. Victor Paul Werewell on believing faith and fear. He says, There is basically only one thing that ever defeats the believer, and that is fear. Fear is the believer's only enemy. Fear is the sand in the machinery of life. When we have fear, we cannot believe God and have faith. Fear has ruined more Christian lives than any other thing in the world. If a person is afraid of not being able to hold his job, do you know what will happen? Mm -hmm. He will lose it. If one is afraid of a disease... He will manifest that disease because the law is that what one believes, in this case, what one believes negatively, he is going to receive. <coughs> People have a fear of the future. They have a fear of death. Fear always encases. It always enslaves. Fear always binds. This law of negative and positive believing works for both Christian and non-Christian. When we believe, we receive the results of our believing regardless of who or what we are. Fear is the only thing that can beat the believer when we allow it, when we allow that fear to beat us. You know who else had fear? Job. <laughs> Everybody knows Job. Job had fear. Let me go through here. We're going to go to Job chapter 3. I'm going the wrong way. <coughs> and he's certainly a record um, that pops into most of our heads when we get talking about fear. But in Job chapter 3 and in verse 25, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. When you are fearful, when you are worrying, when you are doubting, when you're saying, geez, I hope this terrible thing doesn't happen to me, and you linger on it, you are believing negatively. <coughs> that fear is going to creep in, and that is what is going to happen. It's a law. Proverbs 29.
Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That fear is a trap. Yep. It is a trap. It is a trick. But if you put your trust in the Lord, you will be safe. When you put your trust and your faith in God, you are not walking fearful. You're walking boldly and righteously, trusting God. And we'll go one more place here about fear in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. Matthew 14, and we'll start in verse 22. Oh, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. <coughs> if you know the record, Jesus just learned of his cousin, John the Baptist, being killed. And he wants to get, along, get alone, and the people need him. So he teaches the people. He spends all day taking care of other people. Finally, <coughs> he gets to be alone. And he sent his disciples out into a ship while he went up into a mountain. Verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch, which is the last watch right before the dawn, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, Walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out of fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. How many times do we see that in the Word of God? Fear not. Be not afraid. Be of good courage. Be strong in the Lord. We'll go back to our verse in 2 Timothy here. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And there's something about this verse that should draw our attention. I know for a lot of us, this is kind of our reflex verse. I know it is for me when the kids are afraid, if they've got something going on, we say, God didn't give us the spirit of fear. But there's a back half to this verse that sometimes gets forgotten, and it should really draw our attention. So verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Look at the way that God had those words written. That's a figure of speech called polysyndentin. Let me find my definition here. Polysyndentin is the deliberate insertion of conjunctions into a sentence for the purpose of slowing up the rhythm of the prose so as to produce an impressively solemn note. God didn't just list love, power, and sound mind. He said, he said but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. So it's a big signpost that says, pay attention. I want to look at those three words, power, love, and sound mind. The word power here is that word dynamis. A lot of us know that. It's that inherent power. Capability of anything and ability to perform anything. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and in verse 8, says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Ye shall receive power, that gift of Holy Spirit. We've got it. We've got the power. We've got it. We have the power. It's up to us to choose whether to use it or not. It's up to us whether we lambano, whether we receive it in the manifestation. But God gave us this power, this incredible power that makes us capable and able to do everything that God says that we can do, that we can operate all nine manifestations, that we can perform miracles, that we can talk to God, 
that we can be everything that God tells us that we can be. We have power in that name of Jesus Christ. We have power to stand. We have power to stand up and to conquer fear. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. God has given us all things for life and godliness. If God says, I will help you conquer your fears, He will do it. He will do it. <coughs> the next word in that verse is that word love. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. That love is that great word, agape. Agape, the love of God in the renewed mind and manifestation. Bollinger has it as love in its fullest conceivable form. Mm. Uh, I love that. As much as our little pea brains can wrap around how big this love is, it's the fullest conceivable form. It's that love of God. Again, we'll go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we'll start in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There's so many things in those two verses to be happy about. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. That love of God. Flip a couple chapters to chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And in verse 37. All right, 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And that word loved is the same word but in the verb form. It's agapeo. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. Absolutely nothing can separate us from that love of God. And we have that ability to manifest that love of God in this life, even in the face of fear. How many times did Jesus look around at people with compassion? Did He manifest the love of God? Yes. We can have that love of God, love in its fullest conceivable form, mm -hmm. even in the face of fear. We know that love never fails. We know that love conquers fear. So God gave us power, He gave us love, and He gave us a sound mind. The sound mind means healthy, well, sober-minded, controlling in all inordinate desire by self-restraint. You're controlling your mind to be sound. Strong, capable, steady, and clear-minded. Turn to the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 5. We're going to look at a guy who did not have a sound mind. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. 
And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. This man had, obviously, spiritual issues, but he did not have a sound mind. He was not in control. He was not the one determining what was happening to him. Verse 6, But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Jesus is talking right to the devil spirits. He's telling him, Come out of that guy. And Jesus asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto, now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Jesus cast the devils right out of this guy. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the, into the sea. They were about 2,000, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled. Yeah, if you were there just watching your pigs and you saw this happen, you'd probably take off running too. They fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. Verse 15, And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And of course, they were afraid because they didn't understand. They didn't know what was going on. But Jesus was able to heal this man and put him, help him to have a sound mind to get into his right mind. Go back to 2 Timothy. God has already given us these things. When we're born again, we have that power. We have the ability. It's up to us whether we want to use the ability, if we want to use the things that God has given us. Verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So if you're afraid, is it from God? No. No. Fear does not come from God. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I wanted to share one, one last account with you. It's about 15-year-old Claudette Colvin. Most people know the story of Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat and move to the back of the bus, but few people know the courage of Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin was only 15 years old when she refused to move to the back of the bus and give up her seat. This was nine months before Rosa Parks did the same thing, catapulting the civil rights movement forward. Most people know about Montgomery, Alabama's boy bus boycott, but little known is that many women refused to give up their seats, but most of the women were fined and quietly went away. Claudette Colvin did not quietly go away. Claudette had been learning in her school about slavery and the Underground Railroad. Heroes like Harriet Tubman sparked conversations about current day 1955 segregation laws. The stories would help her summon the courage to do something when riding home on the bus. The bus driver told her to move, and she refused. She shook as the bus stopped, and they waited as the driver summoned the police. When the police arrived, they hauled her off the bus, her school books scuttling to the ground in the process. She would spend her first night in jail. All for this exercising the same constitutional rights she was being taught at the school she was going home on the bus from. Colvin would later join three other women and challenge the segregation laws in court, and their court case would successfully overturn bus segregation laws in all of Alabama. We can stand. We can stand up to fear, and we can conquer that fear with all the things that God has given us.